Dementia is not an aging disease. However, it's the most common disease among the aging population. Dr. Babak Nayeri, clinical associate professor from the University of Arizona from the Netflix documentary, This is Dementia. Welcome back to the Neuroscience Meets Social and Emotional Learning podcast for episode number 221. For those who are new here, I'm Andrea Samadhi, author and educator with a passion for learning, understanding difficult concepts, and then breaking them down so we can all use and apply the most current research to improve our productivity and results in our schools, sports environments, and workplaces. This month, we're breaking into a new season on the podcast, season eight, where we'll focus on brain health and learning with a look at how an understanding of our brain can improve learning in ourselves, whether we're adults, teachers, or workers, as well as our future generation of learners. If you've been following our podcast over the seasons, you'll know that our content took a turn towards health and wellness around September of 2020 where we created a bonus episode where we covered the top five brain health and Alzheimer's prevention strategies after watching Dr. David Perlmuter's Alzheimer's, the Science of Prevention documentary. We took a closer look at daily exercise, sleep, eating a healthy diet, optimizing our microbiome, and intermittent fasting as strategies we can all use to improve our brain health with the goal of preventing one of the most devastating degenerative diseases that affects more than 5 million Americans. And I see the number is closer to 6 million now after reading our next guest book. And it's the most common form of dementia, which is a term that describes a variety of diseases and conditions that develop when nerve cells in the brain die and no longer function normally. This number has reached over 80 million cases globally and is expected to double to be 150 million cases by 2050. On today's episode 221, we'll be speaking with Dr. John Denbauer. He's a former clinical neuropsychologist who specializes in early stage preventative medicine, including cognitive, physical exercise and nutrition with a goal of slowing down the natural decline in patients with dementia. At peak, his practice served in the range of 10,000 patients in the U.S., supported by over 100 employees. I listened to a recent podcast Dr. Denbauer did with Graham Brown on the XL podcast, and I learned that while Dr. Denbauer has a passion for disrupting dementia, the umbrella for degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, that there have been many ups and downs in his startup journey as a pioneer in this field of health and wellness disrupting dementia. In today's interview, I'll ask him about the lessons he's learned along the way, the importance of family, and to explain his mission to make a difference for dementia sufferers and their loved ones before the global numbers go from 55 million people living with dementia to doubling these numbers in the next 20 years. Just to note that John Denbauer is not a current licensed psychologist, neuropsychologist, or doctor, and cannot provide medical advice. While researching Dr. Denbauer, I did see some things online that made me wonder why he's not a current licensed psychologist. And if you know me, getting to the truth of something is important. Instead of sweeping what I saw under the rug, I'll ask him directly to explain what happened so we can cover his journey with all the facts uncovered. Let's meet Dr. John Denbauer and learn what we can do to disrupt dementia, strengthen our brains, and apply some of the lessons he's learned in his journey. Welcome, Dr. John Denbauer. Welcome. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, I've got to ask you right off the bat because... You know, when I'm I'm doing some research on somebody, things come up and and I always say, like, if something's on the internet, I'm going to see it because I'm pretty thorough with the research I do. And, you know, your team told me to make sure that I mentioned that you're not a current licensed psychologist, neuropsychologist and doctor. 
And I just wonder what happened to your license? Can I, can we start here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can. Um, it's really dovetails into the sort of what happened with our company and what's, you know, what's generally happening with it now. Um, but so, our, you know, our very, very long story short, um, our company was was real successful in Arizona and um, we were serving thousands of patients in the Phoenix Metro in Arizona um, across statewide. And essentially we, we ended up uh, taking investment uh, from a um, an individual that um, we wish we hadn't and the individual initiated uh, attempted to initiate a hostile takeover of a company and in doing so um, did a variety of things, but uh, not limited to uh, terminating hundreds of our patients um, because of supposed. Um, so he kicked me out of the company and physically took over the location and then proceeded to attempt and did terminate hundreds of patients because their insurance money wasn't paying him enough. Um, and so what I did is I, um, it, we, our family had our, this is again, getting into sort of a the longer version, but our family had our family had our lives threatened, um, by him and some other individuals associated with him. And so we sort of went into a, our home was, um, was ransacked. Um, and so we eventually we left the state. Um, and went into sort of a hiding. And when I was, when this was happening, um, which was around August of 2019, um, I filed, you know, I got the police involved, obviously, and I filed various complaints with state agencies against this individual in an attempt, multiple things, but to get my business back and, and to not have these individuals terminated. Um, and this individual um, responded by filing over 15, I believe, uh, fraudulent board complaints against my license at the state in which I, you know, had spent the last two years and over a hundred thousand dollars attempting to adjudicate. And when it was clear to me that, well, mostly I had run out of money. Uh, we had spent all our money and all my mom's money and all our family's money. Um, when we had run out of money, we had no money to fight anymore, um, to hire lawyers. And then it was clear to me also that I was leaving the state of Arizona and really never coming back um, to practice. And um, when that was clear to me, um, I engaged in a voluntary surrender of my license. So, um, you know, again, it's this is difficult terminology, and I'm certainly not an attorney. And um, you know, I'm not attempting to interpret this for anybody, but um, a voluntary surrender is much different than having your license taken away from you. Um, you, you you're, you're saying, hey, I am voluntarily giving up my license. Um, and of course, it doesn't read that way on the internet or people don't care to read that portion of it. They just see the complaints, which were fraudulent um, and were blasphemous and were heinous, um, but they were not true. And in, you know, just to be clear, I never admitted to doing any of, of that alleged. In fact, in the paperwork, it says that I didn't do that. Um, it just says that I, I, I decided to, because I didn't, you know, I didn't have any more money and I wasn't going back to voluntary surrender the license. So I don't, does that. <laughs> it does now, it, yeah. and it's not a story that I've never heard before for people disrupting an industry. So can we go there? So what did you build? I read your book, and then I looked at the Netflix documentary, This is Dementia, and it definitely hit me to the heart uh, because I've been working 25 years trying to make an impact in education. That's what this podcast is all about. Neuroscience meets social emotional learning, trying to bring credibility to this area. Not different from what you were trying to do, bring awareness to this terrible debilitating disease. But the funds that I've lost with grants are nowhere near the funds that you lost. So can you explain what you built and then what happened? How, what did you learn with raising funds for such a high growth startup, all your successes and failures and why maybe you think you were targeted for doing this? 
Yeah, I mean, great questions. I, I will want to highlight something, um, and I think this is actually really interesting. So you, um, if you don't mind me telling your listeners, you, you know, you were super well prepared and you wanted to look at the Netflix documentary um, uh, a couple of days prior. So about a, three weeks ago, you know, it's had, a, I think, over 150,000 views and, um, you know, it's, it's been out there for a while, but I don't check it very often. And just to be honest, like I don't, it's very painful for me to even it's there's a certain amount of pain that comes with even reintroducing this and i sort of try to avoid it at times um so i didn't even really check on it and then you had contacted you had then i got a message from my team saying hey she can't find it Mm -hmm. so what ended up happening was it was hacked off youtube and it was hacked off of google um and so this this guy has been that's been putting fraudulent things out about me on the nets Etc. Like this is just an example of this continuing. It was totally erased from YouTube and totally erased from Google. So we had to recreate this link and send it to you. And it's not it's not there for public viewing. So there's really I don't think anybody can view it now. So just an example of how this has continued. Right. Um, right. Yeah, so, if it's online, I'll find it. And I couldn't find it. It was like I know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's hard. It's like every day it's a, it's another thing. So, but anyway, okay. So just as an example, I guess. Um, so, okay. So, you know, it really started. So I, uh, I was raised, um, by my mother and my grandmother, um, in, um, in the state I grew up in and my grandmother was an important figure to me. Um, still obviously still is, she's deceased now and she died in 2013 and my grandmother, um, she developed um, dementia later in her life. It wasn't considered sort of an early onset dementia, um, but she did have it. Um, and she died at 93 years old, I believe. And the last, you know, four or five years of her life were very difficult. Um, and that, you know, it's, I don't say that to, to, to suggest that that's unique. It's actually not unique for most people. So when I was, when I she was going through that, I was in Boston, um, studying, um, geriatric neuropsychology, specifically dementia onset, et cetera. And so without me really knowing it, like, you know, sort of a higher power God, um, universe sort of drew that synergy. I think those two things into me. And I, I was sort of galvanized in my life purpose, not just simply my professional purpose, but my life purchase uh, purpose to, uh, to help people with dementia in whatever form I could. And it, you know, just so happened, I was, I, I went to Barrow Neurological Institute to, to get a, um, my postdoctoral, um, work in clinical neuropsychology. So, it, you know, since that time, I basically Medicare, um, I, you know, was heavily researching the topic and the topic is developing sort of non-pharmaceutical approaches to, um, to helping people mitigate the intensity of onset of early stage dementia. Um, so it's not a preventative mechanism. Nothing can totally prevent. It doesn't reverse. Um, nothing can do that. Um, but it helps mitigate. And I found that if people did cognitive therapeutic exercises, things that were new and things that were novel and things that they hadn't done before, that it helped release certain chemicals in the brain and mainly glutamate, um, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. And it helped, um, diffuse the process of, uh, generalized cortical atrophy. And that's just a fancy way of saying the brain shrinking at a faster rate. So, um, Medicare, um, did not pay for this. Um, and I was sort of like, well, most people on a fixed budget, you know, we couldn't necessarily ask people to private pay for this. So I worked for about three or four years um, and did a variety of research to get Medicare to offer a unique uh, CPT code, which is essentially a procedure code, which allows um, people to bill for this with if individuals have a diagnosis of dementia, but also importantly, if individuals don't have a diagnosis of dementia. So they have a, they're normal but they, they can start doing this with the therapist and Medicare will cover it and Medicare Advantage will cover it. So once that happened, which took a long time, and once we got a patent on this, which took you know two or three years, I wanted to do, like I'm a scientist first. So I wanted to do enough research to say that I, that I knew what this was doing. I didn't want to market something that didn't have the research backing. 
because there's a plenty of that in this field. Um, and, and I also, you know, I didn't want to lose my license that way or do anything unethical. Um, so I did that and, or I don't say I, I mean, I primarily did it, but people around me helped obviously. And I did research with UCLA and other institutions. Um, and we got Medicare to pay for it. And then I just started, uh, hiring a speech and language therapist in my office to come in and do this work. And they did. And people liked it and people were, we did the research on it and it was mitigating the, um, the onset. It was pushing out the onset of dementia. Um, we started then hiring occupational therapists, physical therapists, psychologists, neuropsychologists, uh, social workers. We started trying to do a comprehensive holistic. And of course, you know, um, this is growing and then I have no business expertise at all. Um, never took a business class in my life. Um, and, um, somebody said, Hey, you should like, maybe like make a business out of this and grow this. And I, I saw that as the only way of reaching more people was to grow a business. And I saw the business as like, not necessarily a for-profit endeavor, but for something where if I, we made enough profit then we can reinvest it in growing it to reach more people. So I always thought of it very much as the clinician first. And I still think of it that way. So we grew, we grew, we grew. And we, you know, I started uh, getting out of my practice uh, like 20%. And I started going out and doing the startup stuff in Phoenix, which as you know, there's a good, great startup community and uh, became sort of a reluctant untrained CEO, but got a lot of uh, help from people along the way, um, including my uncle, uh, who's the who is a professor emeritus at ASU WP Carey school and other tons of people. And I just got really tenacious and, you know, hung out at events and asked people for help. And then we got to a point, uh, you know, fact we won a bunch of competitions, thank God, and got some money and grew and grew and grew, got an investment. And then we went to Silicon Valley, did an accelerator, um, did really well there, got, I don't know, like half a million in five minutes. Um, in a competition and just, you know, kind of like living the dream quote unquote, um, uh, you know, for startup folks. And at this time in my life, you know, I was married, um, and I, my wife became, um, pregnant, um, in 2019 and we had a baby on the way. And I kind of had a thought that things sort of needed to change in my lifestyle. Um, and I think, other people around me were seeing that I was getting burnt out because I was doing way more business stuff than actually meeting with clients, which is really my joy and passion. And so we had gotten a, a term sheet from a um, private equity firm in New York City. And so we did the whole, you know, we were in Silicon Valley, you know, the whole uh, courting and recruiting stuff. And I remember uh, me and our CTO were in a meeting, a board meeting, you know, like, uh, and... <laughs> The board table was, you know, like, you know, 45, it was one of those out of a movie, 45 chairs long. Oh, wow. We're at one end, the person's at the other end, and uh, they offered us $9 million. Wow. And uh, we were, were like elated. We were staying at, you know, like a, just a junk, red, red infested, you know, place in New York, wow. in Manhattan, just trying to barely scrounging up, you know, money to get um, you know, get plane fare. And we were like super, super elated. And, um, and then, so they said, well, you need to hit these metrics to get the money. So we were supposed to get the money in December of 2018, I believe. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. December of 2018. And we hit all the metrics and unfortunately, and I, I really try to be detailed about this part of it because I want people that are in startup mode to hear this because this is a very common experience i've come to find out extremely common actually very so common. they yeah so they promised this and they signed the sheet and so we plan everybody's planning their whole lives around us. Mm -hmm. um you know we're telling our wives and our husbands and our partners and our dogs you know hey life's going to be better and uh and all we need to do is hit these metrics now of course these metrics are insane so in order to hit these growth metrics, we had to take up more money 
And so the investors were waiting, quite naturally, were waiting on this payout to hit in December of 2018. So they didn't want to invest more money. We didn't have any more personal funds. We had invested it all. And we started just leveraging credit cards and leveraging. And then when that ran out, we, we, we did uh, merchant cash advance loans, which are like super, super high interest loans that essentially will put anybody underwater. Uh, we call they're essentially predatory loans, um, 18% interest, 20% interest, et cetera. And so I, no excuse, but I knew nothing about this. All I need to know is that if we hit these metrics, then life is going to be better. And it's not an excuse. I should have acted differently. Um, and of course, everybody else was on board and psyched for it. Um, and we took a bunch of loans out. And then in December of 2018, a couple of days before Christmas, um, they essentially backed out of it. Wow. Yep. So, which is extremely common. I've yep. come to find out. We thought we were alone in this. Um, but it's like an extremely common thing to do is that they, you know, force, not force, they say, Hey, okay, we're going to sign a term sheet, but all these companies, these 30 companies recording, you need to then hit these hyper aggressive metrics. And then maybe 25% of them do. And out of that, maybe they choose one. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course we didn't have the, the money to fight them and they knew that. So we were then upside down with hundreds of thousand dollars in merchant cash advance loans. And it was very clear after like the first quarter of 2019 that we were done. Like we just could not function anymore. So we, um, and again, I'm telling this sort of in a detailed way to just so people understand these things that other people might do or have done. We wanted to file for bankruptcy, but we had like 50 or 60 employees working for the company. And we thought, um, I, I, I just, it's part of this, I don't know if people can understand it, but part of it is like, it's going to sound weird, but God told me to do this. Right. Like self-preservation, almost like listening to no way thinking of how can we keep going? Cause you've got such a noble cause, all the work and research. I get it. Yeah. So like, I just felt, you know, like I'm a fairly, as you saw in the movie or the book, like I'm a fairly spiritual person. I'm not saying that to suggest that I'm a great person or I do everything right. I just try to listen to, to what God or great spirit wants me to do. And I try to follow that. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I still believe that what God wanted me to do was to try to continue because nobody else was doing this. I kept telling my company, like, there's no backup. Like we are the people that are doing this. And so, uh, so then we went to file for bankruptcy and if we were like, literally we met with an attorney and he said, okay, we got to do X, Y, and Z, and, you know, file for bankruptcy and, you know, too bad, you know, the company's closing and everybody was sad and, you know, whatever. And it was sort of a doorknob comment as I was leaving, but I said, like, isn't there anybody that, you know, that would give loans to people? And in this kind of situation, and he's like, well, and he was very awesome attorney, great person, but he basically, yeah, you know, there's these, um, hard money lenders. And I was like, oh yeah. Okay. Well, and so we met with two or three and the third person we met with ended up being this guy that, uh, lended us money, but then was the person that initiated the hostile takeover of the company. So what my understanding, and this is, I'm not saying this is the case with all hard money lenders, but from my experience and what I've come to know is after talking to various lawyers and other people in this industry is that people make quote unquote livings, unethical livings of like picking up on companies that are in distress and then giving them loans that are very reasonable to get them out of like hard money or to get them out of merchant cash advance loans and stuff. But then they essentially plan on, um, de you know, demolishing the company and then stripping it of all its intellectual property and selling it off and making money that way. So when I left to go to my home state um, for a couple of weeks, 
um, then this individual, and he had a team of people that went into the company, told them that I had sold the company to him. And then basically within two weeks, they had control of our bank account, our Medicare accounts, our websites. And of course, I had given him login access because he said some of his people were going to help him and stuff. So we had been, we lost everything. And then when I tried to fight back, then, you know, home was, all that stuff happened. So yeah, that's kind of where, where do you go from here? Where do you go? And, and why I'm asking, I actually just interviewed someone, um, a couple episodes ago, Hillary de Caesar, and she's releasing a book called relaunch tomorrow. And she was on the TV show, secret millionaire and, mm -hmm. uh, helps people relaunch. So, you know, just thinking about what you lost how do you go from there to where you are now? What did you do to get to where you are now? Are you still rebuilding? Do you have people to help you relaunch? What's going on? Yeah, no, that's an awesome question. Um, yeah, I, I'm just, you know, honestly, like I am every day is a, um, uh, it's still, you know, two and a half years later, I guess it still feels in some ways like yesterday. So long story short, very little is being done in this area. Um, I, it, to be honest, like I really want to, but I don't know how. Um, and it's sort of like my wife's safety, my son's safety, my safety, um, just trying to crawl back. Um, it's just been hard to overcome people's um, negative perception of me as a person. And that's just sort of a daily challenge, to be honest. Um, so it's kind of almost at a very base level. No, I do teach, I did teach a class in, in neuropsychology and that was great. So there's other things that were happening, but in terms of the company level, um, I'm trying, I just don't, <laughs> I could use some advice, I think. Sure. Well, what yeah. I'm first like comes to mind because it's a heartbreaking story. You have a noble cause that the world needs. And you watch, you read the book, you watch the documentary, there's a need here. And I lost my uncle um, to dementia when he actually passed away at 58. So he was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. And, you know, that was devastating to watch, you know, my cousins lose their dad. And so what you've got here is very powerful. So definitely I'm going to send you the link to this lady's book launch re relaunch because mm. you could use a relaunch and yeah. we're here for ideas. That's what the podcast is all about. And when I saw your story, I thought this is heartbreaking. It's insane. It took me back. And as you're talking, it took me back to when I landed in the U S to come here after Columbine happened, I left Toronto to move to the US to see how I could help education here. And then bam, September 11th happened. Mm. So here I was in the US, like in Phoenix, and I worked as a nanny at the Arizona Biltmore and I yep. cleaned houses. So not far off from how you're rebuilding because you got to yep. get some way that you get yourself back on track with lots of lessons learned for anyone listening that that you lost everything but it's not lost so can we like go now into just what you know about alzheimer's and dementia because that's your strength and that's yep. what you know how do we know what it is how do we recognize it and from your skills from the past how could we mitigate it so we can learn from you today yeah, no. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. And I do want to add, I've had a lot of blessings in my life and it's, it is weird. And so I have a son and, uh, it's been great being a father. That's been awesome. So just really blessed to had to say that. So basically, um, we have not done a good job, uh, from a public health campaign of educating people, what actually dementia is because very smart people like yourself and the average person. And you saw by the documentary or the book, they, most people don't know the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia, which is like akin to saying, what's the difference between, I don't know, I'll make up an example, like a tool and a saw. It's so basic that people should know it, yet people don't. So basically dementia is this umbrella term. It's just basically like, um, like saying cancer. It describes a variety of a very diverse variety of 
diseases. And I think that's the thing to keep in mind is that dementia is as diverse as cancer. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, certainly it all takes place in the brain and central nervous system, but the etiology or the cause of it is very diverse. So you have, um, Alzheimer's, which is in some cases, the most common form of dementia, but in a lot of cases is not. And the other thing to keep in mind is that there's no really one pure form of dementia. So we think about Alzheimer's or vascular or Pick's disease or prion disease. They all are distinct, but they're, but dementia is sort of an alphabet soup. It's all a mix of different types. One may be more prominent and we may call something Alzheimer's, but it does don't, don't let that fool you into thinking that it's only Alzheimer's. So at the root of everything is the brain shrinking, the cortex of the brain shrinking at a uh, rate that is too fast um, and is faster than normal aging. So the brain naturally shrinks in normal aging. The brain naturally shrinks over time when we get into our 80s and 90s. Now, really, it starts in our 60s. And that's not bad. But when it starts shrinking quickly, then that's a problem. And there's a variety of reasons why it does that. You know, one is old age, but in abnormal aging, it's it's can be due to a variety of causes. So in Alzheimer's, you've heard about the plaques and tangles, um, neurofibrillary tangles and tau um, deposits. It's a certain protein that there's too much of it. So all this stuff happens in the brain and Alzheimer's is a very genetically based disease. So um, this is not altogether true, but we really haven't developed any way, any ways of identifying exactly who's going to get Alzheimer's and then why some people get it and why some people don't. And they have this very similar genetic structures. So we're in the process of doing that, but it's obviously the gene genetic structure is very, very difficult to ask and, you know, ascertain. There's one allele called APOE4, and you, I'm sure people have heard of that. And that's sort of a little bit of a biomarker, but we don't know for sure. So what I kind of, when I looked at this, and this is just my take on it, is when I looked at everything, I was like, we're doing a lot of really, really good science in this area, but nobody can say, and probably, unfortunately, nobody will say anytime soon, we know exactly what's causing this and we know exactly what to do about it. Because another thing to keep in mind is that the drugs that we have that act supposedly act as mitigative agents are not used early on. They're used very much at the point where people get dementia. And at that point, they're very much used as they they have less than a 5% efficacy. They really are not that effective. So I'm thinking of things like Nemenda or Aricept. So we don't really have drugs that are very effective as well. So in looking at animal models and looking at other things, we, you know, it's, it's at least obvious to me that one thing that we can do is exercise our brain in the right ways. So cardi good cardiovascular health is by far the most important, uh, thing that you can do to help, um, prevent and mitigate the onset of dementia, good cardiovascular health. So eating right, exercising, keeping your hemoglobin A1C in check, uh, keeping your blood pressure and your cholesterol levels in check. That is like 60% at least of the battle. So for the stuff that you can control, that is by far the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. So people that are obese or whatever, so staying in really good physical health. And then, and I'm and just, you know, I am not a physical health person professionally, but um, from a cognitive standpoint, one of the big mistakes that we've made is we've told people, keep your brain active as you age. Everybody's heard that, keep your brain active. But what people end up doing is they end up doing the things that they are the most um, used to doing. So let's just say, you know, you're, I don't know, you're a gardener and you like gardening in your spare time and you retire, you do more gardening. What you don't do quite naturally are the things that, that you either don't like doing or the things you're not accustomed to doing, which are usually sort of one and the same. So we know that novelty, doing th new things, not necessarily hard things, but doing new things is really good for the brain, that it produces chemicals in the brain that help prevent the brain from shrinking. 
um, at such a fast rate. Now it does not, it just to be clear in my, my words, help prevent, not prevent. Um, so I use the term mitigate. Um, so if people and we found through our research that if people engage in two to two and a half hours a day or not a day, I'm sorry, a week of discipline, somewhat disciplined, focused, uh, learning in a new area, like learning a foreign language is a great one, um, that they will release more glutamate in their brain and they have at least a 45% increase in, well, a 45% increase in glutamate and therefore a decrease in cortical atrophy over time. So I just, so it's to me, like, I'm, I'm not a very smart person. Like I tend to think of things really simply that helps my brain understand things. I just think like, this is no, I always tell people, this is no, like, it's not product specific. Like, it's not like our thing is the only thing that you can do. And, uh, and this is the only thing that works. Like I always tell people, if you don't want to meet with a, one of our clinicians or whatever, or do our brain games online, you don't have to do it. You just have to do something that's new and novel for two and a half hours a week. It's, it's kind of like exercising. You could go to the gym and that helps you sort of stay disciplined and it has more machines and more variety, but you don't, you, you don't need to, you can strap on shoes and go walking in your neighborhood. Right. Um, so, so it's really that process of doing the right kind of mental exercise is the biggest thing to help mitigate. I, and I find that that's still very much lacking. A lot of people, when I do talks nationally or internationally, they won't buy our products. That's not the, that's not the goal. Um, you know, probably in a lot of ways, that's why I wasn't a great CEO. Um, like I wasn't selling a product I'm just trying to sell a lifestyle change. Got it. So, so to mitigate exercise kind of cleans the brain from these two proteins that are bad that could build up. Is that one way exercise, diet, nutrition, would you say it cleans the brain or? Yeah, I might rephrase that. Yes. I think that's the right idea. I might rephrase that. We don't really know a lot about these proteins and tau developments. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I don't, from what I know, the, the cognitive exercise I think the cleaning analogy is correct. I don't know how it impacts tau specifically, but I would say that the process of exercising helps release more good chemicals in the brain to help prevent the overall atrophy. Got it. Just like your um, novel activity releases, it's the glutamine that that we yeah. want to. Yeah, I don't know how it combats the bad proteins. I just know that as an excitatory neurotransmitter, it signals to the rest of the brain don't shrink so fast. Got it. But there's a lot of things that are happening, like in Alzheimer's, there's six or seven different things that are happening at once. And the glutamate release really only combats a couple of them. But the, um, the things that it, it does combat are the general overall atrophy. So what I tried to do is I tried to find the commonality across all forms of dementia. And the main commonality is atrophy but like with alzheimer's the um you know the plaques and tangles the vascular dementia the microvascular ischemic changes and other things like i'm not the glutamate doesn't directly impact that at all that's a different that's a something else that's hurting the brain that we don't really honestly have anything for besides diet and exercise and you just pray that you get good genetics at this point so we, we interviewed someone from Dr. Daniel Amon's offices, like a oh, while yes. back. So it's Shane Creato. And he said, Hey, if you guys want to go get your brain scanned, my husband and I just to go look, because I started thinking, well, let's see what our brain looks like. And so we were lucky to get this VIP um, scan from his offices to go look. And uh, my number one question was, is, uh, does it look like our brains are shrinking? And the only thing that, that it showed, I did a whole episode on the results. My main thing was sleep mm -hmm. deprivation. I could get more sleep and, um, but, and it made me look at that area and focus in on that, but we can all go get brain scans at Amon's clinics. Those they're costly. And so 
What are some other ways that we can mitigate this and perhaps so it's not such a shock? Because if the numbers are doubling and tripling, we can't all get a brain scan. How can we know? Is it just the symptoms? We start being forgetful or what, what do we look for? Yeah, that's the problem. That's why this is so alarming from a general societal and international level is that you don't know you have it from a brain scan perspective, but also from a symptoms perspective, you don't know that you're going to get it until you have it. Mm -hmm. And then when you have it, it's too late. It's really too late at that point. So the key, this is what I was really trying to reinforce. And, you know, a lot of people probably think I'm somewhat weird on this, but like I equate it to mammograms, you know, or prostate checks. It's like, there's a certain age where we are supposed to get these regularly and just monitor these in preventative standpoint. And so my, what I was, another area that I was trying to go into was to get Medicare to pay for, um, you have a wellness check when people get on Medicare at 65 or they're given the option to get on Medicare. I was uh, proposing that they have a neuropsychological examination at 65. And then you have one every two years after that, or sooner, if you get as wellness checks, if you get in, or if you get, think you're having problems, you can go in and get this paid for. But right now, Medicare won't do that from a wellness perspective, or Medicare, Medicare Advantage. They'll only pay for it if you have a diagnosis, which is super counterintuitive. So that is the key. If people can start getting in this, and then when you get people get on this insurance 65, then they can start being monitored. And then they can start getting reimbursed for scans. And they can start monitoring this as they enter into from adulthood, older adulthood into um, older age. And that if we train and educate our primary care providers to look to say like, Hey, let's incorporate the results here of this thing. And if somebody needs to go see a neuropsychologist who are often underutilized in this fashion, then they, then they can. And, and I think until we get that reimbursable, then people aren't going to pay a thousand dollars or $2,000 out of pocket just to do something preventative. Most people won't, as you said, so a lot of it is a policy and societal change too. But I, I always say to people like, don't depend on systems to change in order for you to do the right things, because this is going to, this may never change. Um, so, you know, keeping really, truly keeping your heart health healthy. And particularly if you have a genetic risk of high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, and really doing daily, daily aerobic exercise, that's super huge. And then, but then the thing that most people are missing are the right kinds of cognitive exercise. So people that are in their sixties, they're still working or in their seventies that are still working. See if you can do an hour to hour and a half a week of studying a foreign language. And by studying, it doesn't need to be torture, just learning something new that's different from what you do. Learning and, how brain works is new and different. And, and yeah. you know, even just looking up what beta amyloids and tau are was yes. stretched my brain. Totally. Yeah. And all these things are great and they don't need to be like drudgery. Like I had a lot of clients. It was always great that they would uh, pick up like Italian and then they go to a trip to Italy and they learn like they do, they turn it into a thing. Right. Right. Well, I've got to go to this whole spiritual side of you, because as I was researching you, I was looking for the why behind the years of work and, and you have put in so many years of work to this. And then it, as I watched the documentary, I saw, you know, your whole grandmother's onset of dementia, which kind of um, was the, to me, it looked like the launching point for you as to, to the why. And now you've got your family, you've got so much knowledge. So I hope you don't give up on what you've built and find another way around this. But I've just got to ask you because you put a tattoo of your grandma on your back yeah, to motivate you and inspire you personally and professionally. And, right. and I gotta say, when I turned 50, I put a tattoo on my ankle for the same reason to motivate and inspire me daily. But you put it on your back. You don't get to see it daily. So how do you how do you motivate? I see, it, I, yeah, I see it every day. I think it's because I'm like in a mirror or something when I'm taking okay. a shower. So I do see it every day. I did. I sort of, it was that moment. I don't know if I could, I fully articulate it until you said that. Like, like I put, I wanted to put something permanent, permanent 
that I saw all every day to know like, Hey, this is your thing. Yeah. You know, like, like it's really not a choice that I, I see it as like, I see it as like, I'll, you know, like whatever and however God has placed me in the world to do good in this area, then that's my, that's my goal. And it's like, it obviously wasn't, well, it, at least at this point, wasn't to run a company and to do, do it that way. But, you know, like I just had a conversation last night at a tennis event where I, somebody just, you know, I have all these conversations randomly where I'm somewhere and nobody knows anything about me. And they'll say, I'll say, how's your family? And they'll say, well, I, you know, I have this happening and I'll, you know, I won't say anything about my background. I'll just say, Hey, well, maybe you want to check out X, Y, and Z. So I feel like God's putting those conversations in my life or meeting those people for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like I'm a little bit more, I mean, it is very, very hard in day-to-day -day level. Like, you know, being in my office is always bittersweet in a lot of ways. And, uh, talking about is always bittersweet, but it's good because it's like, um, you know, I'll have a, it wasn't, you know, startup is great. Um, but there is a lot of glitz and glamor quote unquote in that, in the end, that wasn't really what God wanted me to do. I think there's something else out there. I just don't know what it is. Yeah. Well, I, I do hope that you don't give up because I learned so much from watching your documentary, reading your book, you have a lot behind you. So I, I hope that you continue to spearhead forward in some way with helping bring awareness to this devastating disease. I hope you do. Do you have any final thoughts? Is there anything that I've missed that, that we haven't covered? Anything come to mind as we're talking that you thought I've got to say this? No, I just really, really appreciate you having me on and I'll just maybe reassert like, as this continues, there is going to be a lot more products and marketing things out there. And some of them may work. And I always tell people, if it works for you and you feel like it works for you, go for it. No matter what anybody says, as long as they're harmful to you or somebody else. But I will say this, like the simplest things are typically the most effective. And regardless of what product is out there, people tend to know generally what they have to do it's really in a, the end disciplining yourself to do it and you know i would not have unfortunately lofty expectations that things will reverse or mitigate significantly but if you can mitigate 10 percent or 15 percent or 20 percent that that will result in longevity and quality years um and i think that that's worth it so um so anyway that would be my final thought well, for people that want to reach out to you, is the best place johndenbauer.com or if someone wants yeah. to contact you? Yeah, that would be the best place to reach me, johndenbauer.com. And then, um, yep, that would be the best place to reach me. And I do respond to those things. Um, and then, yeah, we're going to, we're in the process. Of hopefully by the end of the week, we'll have some stuff back up um, online, but uh, my stuff gets hacked all the time. So we'll see, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Well, we're sending like positive thoughts your way that you continue to spearhead the way with regards to this topic, because you've got a lot of information. I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much. It was really, really wonderful. I appreciate you looking into it and, um, and have a great day to all your viewers. You too, John. Take care. Bye-bye. Wow. That was a heartbreaking interview. I knew it was going to be difficult during the research phase, but knew there would be many lessons for all of us to hear. Since our focus of season eight of the podcast is on brain health as it relates to learning, I wanted to debrief this interview and think about everything that stood out for me. There were a few important lessons. The first lesson made me think of something my dad used to say all the time, and it's easy for us to see in hindsight. He would always say, never a lender, nor a borrower be. And I know it must have been difficult for Dr. Denbauer to share the story of where borrowing money took him drastically off course. If you've ever been in a pinch financially, and we've all been at some point, borrowing money to help get you past your difficult time isn't usually the best solution. Even if it's from someone you know well and trust, like someone in your family, it still does cause tension. 
The best solution is to find another way forward, either by earning it yourself or change the direction until you have the resources you need. I know that Dr. Denbauer wanted to share the details of his journey so that others could see where he made turns that sent him off course with his goals so that those listening can learn from his mistakes. The second lesson is to find a new way forward. We all get stuck, but when we know what we're meant to do, we've got to find a new way forward. To see someone with years of work invested in his passion lose their way made me think of all the people who might be lost in their way during the pandemic. I watched companies merge and people being displaced, not sure of where to go next. I'm sure those of you listening could tell me a million stories like this of loss and disappointment. And as difficult times in our world continues, stories like John's aren't going to disappear. What I loved about this interview is that Dr. Denbauer is not giving up, and I know he'll find a new way forward. He acknowledged how difficult it was, but he's clear on his direction, and his tattoo of his grandmother reminds him of this daily. If you watch the interview, Dr. Denbauer's face lit up when he spoke about his grandmother and what she represented to him. If you have something important to you, like Dr. Denbauer, you too will find a new way forward if you've been taken off track. And finally, keep learning. We know that our brain health is crucial for all of us to live up to our full capacity. And Dr. Denbauer reminded us that good cardiovascular health will get us 60% of the way, but to keep learning and doing things that stretch our brain in the process. I hope that you found Dr. Denbauer's story to be helpful. If you want to reach out to him, go to johndenbauer.com and send him a message. Like all of us, we could all use as much positive energy and love directed towards us and our goals. I'll close with a quote from Steve Jobs reminding us that what we're doing here will send a giant ripple through the universe. I'll see you with our next episode in a few days.